Good afternoon. It's a beautiful summer Sunday afternoon here in Sydney. Probably, well, certainly was up over 30. So given my Irish ancestry, my quite strong Irish ancestry, it's appropriate, I believe, to talk something about reasonably early uh, Irish Christian history. I'm going to read from a volume here, uh, which I've part read and which I've had for a number of years, uh, which is by the Professor of Celtic uh, from University of Oxford, one Professor Thomas Charles Edwards. And his early Christian history, the 2000 edition from Cambridge University Press, uh, claims to be and sets out to be a first, the first fully documented history of Ireland and the Irish between the 4th and 9th centuries AD from St. Patrick to the Vikings. This is the earliest period for which historical records are available. And from what I have read, uh, which is about one or possibly even two thirds of this volume, a very interesting read it is indeed. I had a good read of it before I went to Ireland for the first time in my life in 2006, and it had a big impact and greatly informed that trip, those travels. I'm going to read sections here uh, from starting at page 211 of the volume. And what I want to bring out to the listener is what I learned for the first time in reading this volume is that Patrick, in fact, is not the first Christian uh, to go to Ireland to convert the Irish. Palladius, sent by Rome, was in fact the first Christian um, missionary, as it were. And that was in the 430s and the 440s AD. The volume goes on. In the 430s and 440s, the mission of Palladius was the most immediate example of this mission to all peoples, through which the divine calling of all nations, Tato omnino genitium, could be realised. It was also a dramatic instance, well known to both Pope Leo and Prosper, one of his uh, staff, both of whom were in Rome in the 430s, of the role of the Sea of Rome in preaching the gospel to the barbarians, the so-called barbarians. The apostles preaching to Parthians and Medes at Pentecost would serve as the starting point of Prosper's argument in D. Unco Tony, but he concludes by declaring that the Principatus of the Apollosic Sea, the authority of Rome, had been extended farther, for, farther than it had been by the force of arms. For Leo's argument, Rome was the starting point and this conclusion, and therefore the mission to the Irish was crucial. Celestine had ordained and sent Palladius. Admittedly, he did not cite the mission openly in his sermon. A Roman audience might be expected to take more interest in an elegant statement of its enhanced authority under the Christian dispensation than in any detail about the Irish, uh, those people sodden in porridge. In porridge. The Irish mattered to Leo rather than to the Romans. They also mattered, however, to his advisor, Prosper. He might start from a different point and seek to exalt divine grace more than the city of Rome, but the links between D. Voctoni and Leo's sermon are sufficiently close to make it clear that they are different applications of a single idea, namely that the Christian gospel had surpassed the Roman Empire in territor territorial extent. This idea was under development by Leo and his advisors from early in his pontificate, as can be shown by putting the different versions of the sermon and Prosper's work side by side. Just excuse me while I wet my lips and my whistle with a nice cup of Lipton's tea. From this period of intense discussion in the 440s, we may then turn to Prosper's earlier works. Contra Calatrium of around circa 434 and the Chronicle, the first version of which may be assigned to much the same period. At this point in section 21 in Contra Calatrium, Prosper is praising the initiatives taken by Celestine in defence of the doctrine of grace and against the Pelagian heresy. More on the Pelagian heresy later, but it comes up quite a bit in this extract, as you'll hear. The conclusion of his argument is that the authority of Rome had spoken decisively against Pelagius and his disciples. Celestine's energy in defence of the faith, faith was demonstrated for Prosper by his having rescued Britain from heresy and Ireland from paganism. In his chronicle, he says that in 429, Celestine sent Germanius, 
Yusa Sua as his representative to a Britain, to rid, I should say, Britain of Pelagianism. And in 431, he sent Palladius as bishop for the Irish who believed in Christ. There you have it. In 431, uh, Palladius was sent as bishop for the Irish uh, who already believed in Christ. So Palladius, and certainly not Patrick, uh, they were not the first Christians in Ireland. They were already Christians, but Palladius was sent there in 431 to work with them and develop the faith. And we will see in due course, maybe not in this a recording, that is before Patrick got back into uh, Ireland as a missionary. Nevertheless, um, back in 431, at this period, circa 430, we're close to Prosper's first visit to Rome, where the Archdeacon Leo was already in a position to influence, not confined, of influence, not confined to the city, as is shown by his friendship with Cassian. There is a link between Germanus' expert expedition to Britain and Palladius's to Ireland, which goes beyond the probability that the latter was Germanus's deacon and was sent by him to Rome to gain papal authority for the visit to Britain. The words of Prosper, while he labours to keep the Roman Ireland Catholic, he also made the barbarian Ireland Christian. Written only two or three years after Palladius was sent to Ireland, already opposed Roman Empire and barbarian Christianity in a manner which anticipated Leo's sermon number 82. Yet they represented aspiration rather than achievement. Continued hopes for Palladius's mission entertained in Rome and in Gaul, uh, part of which, or Gaul, forms part of modern day France and, from my understanding, tends to be the southwest, where rugby these days is very popular. Uh, and in Gaul, rather than con congratulations addressed to the Pope, whose emissary had completed his task. Palladius could not conceivably have converted the whole island in three years since 431. What the text shows, contrary to the views of some commentators, is that the papacy envisaged the conversion of all the Irish, not just pastoral care for a few Irish Christians or for British slaves living in Ireland, but a full-scale mission to the entire island. It's interesting to observe at this point that, in fact, um, Patrick first spent time in Ireland as a slave. I don't know whether he was Christian at that time, but when he returned to England, uh, he certainly became a Christian and took on um, clerical orders. Nevertheless, the uh, Charles Edwards continues, Irish texts concerning St. Patrick from the late 7th century were concerned to extract what they could from the notice of Palladius in Prosper's Chronicle. That is, they wanted to wipe out a lot of that history because it didn't really allow them to promote the role of Patrick, St. Patrick, they wanted to. So those commentators pass over in silence or minimise the achievements of Palladius, Bishop Palladius of the Irish Christians. It is tempting to follow them so far as Palladius may be supposed to have disappeared from the concerns of popes and Gallic bishops once he crossed the Irish Sea. At the theoretical level, at least, the evidence of Prosper's De Victoni Omnium Gettinium and of Leo's Sermon 82 shows that this is wholly untrue. For 20 years, at least, Palladius' mission remained a matter of deep concern for both Leo and Prosper. Moreover, the consecration, consecration by the Pope of the Bishop for the Irish was directly relevant to Canon 28 of the Council of Chasselon and thus to papal relations with both the Eastern Empire and the Bishop of Constantinople. One of the main impulses behind the theoretical elaboration of papal primacy from Damascus to Egelalysis was fear of imperial domination. Imperial laws had indeed conferred major powers upon the Bishop of Rome by which he might intervene in other provinces, but that only made it the more important to base the, base, the papal primacy on something other than imperial decrees. Otherwise, the Bishop of Rome would become merely an imperial official. The activities of Germanus and of Palladius in Britain and in Ireland demonstrated that a Christian and papal Rome, the Rome of Peter and Paul, could intervene to safeguard and to spread the faith in an Ireland which had been which had thrown off imperial authority, and also in another Ireland which had never been subject to the sway of the emperor. 
The Christian faith and the authority of Christian Rome extended not only to Roman citizens, not just to Parthenians, Medes and Elamites, but to rebellious Britons and even to the barbarian Irish. Muddy Shiraz, 1997, their museum collection, very nice. There is no reason to believe that Leo the Great's interest in Britain and Ireland was merely theoretical. The second mission of Germanus in Britain, which E. A. Thompson would rate, sorry, would date to 437 or possibly 436, but others to the 440s, and therefore within Leo's pontificate, is further evidence that the concerns of 429 to 31 remain pressing, in spite of a slackening of the Pelagian controversy in Gaul. One can't cannot argue from the silence of Patrick's Confessio and Epistola and Archoracium about Palladius that the latter's mission had been cut short. It remains exceedingly likely that the lack of latter evidence about Palladius, other than passages seeking to remove him from the scene before Patrick's arrival, is simply is due simply to patrician hagographers skill in transferring elements from the career of Palladius to that of Patrick. Columbus Columbanus reference in his letter in his letter to Pope Boniface to Irish preservation of the Catholic faith as it was transmitted to us to, to us first of all by you the successors of the holy apostles is reasonably taken as a reference to the mission of Palladius when Columbanus left Ireland for Gaul in around 590 much more may have been remembered about the first bishop of Irish i.e. Palladius, that has come down to us. In the last years of Leo's pontificate, it was becoming increasingly difficult to maintain lines of communication between Rome, southern Gaul and the British Isles. The Gallic Chronicle of AD 452 does not reveal triumphs of bishops against Pelagians or missions to the Irish in part, perhaps because his theological sympathies ran counter to those of Prosper. What he does record is the subject, subjection of the Britons to Saxon power. The appeal of the Britons to Actius confirms the approximate accuracy of the Chronicle's entry in so far as it shows the Britons in grave difficulties, although Galadus himself sets the letter in the context of Irish and Pictish, not Saxon attacks. A Britain and Ireland under the benign authority of Papal Rome in which Leo had delighted in 441 was only a brief, interval, a brief interval between the end of imperial authority and the devastating expansion of Saxon power in the 440s. Prosper's hopes of barbarian inroads leading to barbarian conversion were borne out in the long run, but the next dramatic advance in Western Europe, the conversion of Clovis, so a Frank Frankish king concerned to advance his relations with the Emperor Anastasia more than with the Pope. So there we have it. We'll continue on at another stage.